All right, so I'm going to welcome Lance Rhodes, Pastor Rams, Lance Rhodes, up to the podium today. Let's welcome him. Hey, everybody. So glad to be here this morning and be able to celebrate and speak into this house. Uh, thanks for taking a minute and considering our facility transition. Um, to just add a couple extra sentences of context to the video, uh, we have been in, uh, in the downtown Pittsburgh area for uh, about 12 years, and over the last 12 years, our church has moved 13 times. Uh, we have been in this current facility for three and a half years. We purchased it three years ago, and um, we, love, we love this building. It's an old bar that we got to take over, and I, I got all the pictures of the old bar, and we took it all out, and I love just redeeming broken stuff. I mean, it's just yeah. me. But um, when, when we got it, we knew when we purchased it that there was a possibility that the city was going to purchase the property from us in a short period of time because they wanted to widen the road that our building sits on. And... Uh, because it's, a very, it's very much a, a landlocked city because of all the rivers and all the bridges and all this stuff, so there's not a lot of room to expand roads. And uh, so this developer has come to us, and uh, when we did this video about two and a half weeks ago. This week they came to us, increased their offer by another $50,000 to try to get us out sooner. <laughs> and um, we're really excited about this because... Uh, we were already bursting at the seams. On a good Sunday, we could have 25 kids in a 700 square foot children's space. And um, that's a lot of toddlers. <laughs> and uh, we, we, needed, we needed to have something change. And uh, this couldn't be a more perfect timing for us uh, for this transition to take place. And so we, we were looking around at facilities, knowing that they were offering us about $250,000 to $300,000. Um, for our property right now, they're at 300, which is amazing. And um, we we found a property, but the problem with the property is that it's 600 thousand dollars, and so this gap is pretty big. The seller has agreed to undersell the property for little value to us, so they came down 150 thousand dollars for us, wow. um, so that we could we could purchase the property which you saw in there, which had the theater marquee. It's a, old theater in the community which still has the theater front. They never tore it out even though it got turned into a um, cubicle farm. They never tore the stage or the theater stuff out. Oh, wow. So we still have a stage and wow. we sell everything that we need um, and we're going to take our kids 700 square foot space and turn it into a 4,000 square foot space. <laughs> We are really excited, so we have a small gap left between what they're offering us. And I, listen, I'm very thankful they've come up, but they haven't come up enough to cover the gap. Mm -hmm. So they've asked us to step in to cover up, cover up that gap some, and uh, that's why we're raising money. So I appreciate that. Please pray for us, because this we're looking at this happening within the next four weeks. Wow. So I need around right now, I, I think my treasurer said the last number was around $94,000 is the gap. Um, so pray for us uh, because we, we need to somehow make that happen. But um, as as I know you know, uh, nothing's too hard for the Lord. That's right. That's right. So I have no idea how he's going to make it happen, but I know he's going to make it happen. There have been way too many things that point us to this location for this season. And, um, and you know, there's... We'll be able to say you know, we're debt free. I mean, that's that's you know that's an amazing thing yes. um, as a church to be able to stand up yeah. and say we get to funnel all of our money back right into the community, yeah. and that's what we want to do. I know that's what your guys are aiming to do here. So I'm here today to just encourage you some and share a little bit about my story, and uh, also to speak prophetically into this house. I appreciate uh, Matt extending. The invitation to me to be here and I know that not many of you might have a clue who I am and that's totally cool because I don't have a clue who you are um, and that's great I know I know Matt and Bev I've met Mike once or twice before and that's about it I don't recognize anybody else and today we're gonna have some time because I have a very strong feeling that it's gonna be some prophetic ministry later so I want you all to know that 
you're going to have to not give me any little list of people or anything to say. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't have any of that, but I'm here to say some things. And um, I know God's going to do some things. Uh, the Lord has given me a strong prophetic calling. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't look the part. I've always said I should grow a beard because I think that would help. Um, but I, I don't look the part, but I do carry this mantle with me. Um, and because of that, uh, God has done a lot of really unique things. And I'd like to just take a few minutes to start, but just give you an understanding of what I felt the Lord showed me. Uh, a variety of ways the prophetic ministry manifests in the body of Christ. I know that the scripture tells us and there are people that are called specifically to carry a prophetic mantle called a prophet that they go and help shift futures. And I would say that specifically, that when, when a pro prophet ministers, prophets shift futures because oftentimes they create the future with the words that they communicate. Now this is different than just a general prophetic ministry because the reality is the scripture is very clear in the book of Corinthians that every single believer has the ability to prophetically hear God's voice and communicate that word. So every single one of you have the ability to prophesy. But you might not prophesy in the same way that I prophesy. I want you to understand how I prophesy today so that you have faith to believe that when I say what I'm going to say later, that it will actually create something with us. Because there is a, a strong connection between the faith of the atmosphere and the ability of the prophetic word to release something in on the earth. Okay? I want you to understand. Does that make sense? Yeah. You guys with me so far? Yeah. All right. Now, um, I'd like to just, we're going to at some point in time today so you can get it ready. I don't know when, but we'll just get it ready. If you have a Bible, you can open up the first, I'm sorry, second Kings. We're going to be in chapter three. That's where we're going to end up some point. But I know with the flow of how it is. See, to me, uh, some years ago, uh, I tapped into this different kind of prophetic movement. And it happened because I had this idea that it was my, uh, it was my birthday. And I went online and I said, for my birthday, I'm going to prophesy over 500 random people over the internet. And so we put a, uh, put a blurb out on Facebook and just said, uh, if you want to get a prophetic word, just put in your name and your email. That's all I want, your name and your email. And, uh, and I'll record a prophetic word and I'll email it to you. And here's the deal, guys. Within like one day, I received 1,500 requests. <laughs> and got something around 5,000 people requested before I shut the form down because... <laughs> I was only going to do 500. <laughs> and, um, and I sat in my office and for eight hours a day, for many days, mm -hmm. prophesied over people that I've never met and um, recorded them and sent them out, not knowing that I was prophesying over people that work in the UN, that I spoke to uh, security detail for presidents. Uh, that I prophesied over celebrities. Um, I spoke over at least three uh, major uh, athletes in, in the NFL. It was the most ridiculous. I don't even know who these people were. I, mean, I got their name, and I don't follow sports at all. That's not a nerd at the core. So sports don't mean anything to me. But I was just like, oh, okay, here's this person. I prophesied over them. And then later, I start looking at everybody's names and start realizing, oh, snap. <laughs> These people are kind of important. <laughs> and I had no idea. I had no idea. Uh, but this happened for me. And I, um, it opened up this arena. Um, to me, it's like um, you put your head underwater and then you, and you open your eyes and you're like, wow, I can actually see something. It's weird. Because you never think you can see anything underwater until you open your eyes. And all of a sudden, your eyes can acclimate to it on some level. And yeah, everything's all weird. but. You get that way, then you put goggles on, you get to walk up your eyes and I can see normal. Mm -hmm. That's how this prophetic gifting in me has evolved. After doing that, um, when I get into prophetic mode, uh, I can just go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I can't, I can just, just go for hours. 
Uh, we're not going to do that today because I, I was given strict instructions that you guys don't leave here until 2 o'clock, so I won't go past 2. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Now we're we're going to have some time. Have some time. But I have. I, I've been in some meetings. Some meetings are what's crazy. We just go for it. But um, I was in a meeting one time um, a couple years ago, right after this had happened, and I was just prophesying over people, and I prophesied for six hours in a meeting. I prophesied over 220 people in a meeting that night. They actually brought me dinner on the platform in the middle of prophesying because we had gone so long. Um, and, and, and I was just like, oh, whatever, you know, and I just kept, kept going. I did have to go to the bathroom at one point, but that was, <laughs> was what it is. So <laughs> I was going to say, I only understand that, that, that this to me is something that once we get in the mode, we're just going to, we're going to roll with it mm -hmm. and, and, and just see what, what God has to say. Uh, I have no plans, but I know that when I get in this place, um, and I have felt, I don't always go, it's not everywhere, everything, I want you to understand that. But I really feel that that's going to happen here in a little bit, so we're going to get there, and I want you to have a, a context. Um, a few things have happened. One time we, we were in a meeting in Greensboro, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour and a half from where I live, and we were having an extended period of worship there, and um, uh, shortly after the worship, the Lord just, uh, like, kind of tapped in this prophetic vein, and, and I, I had this vision, I just shared the vision, I said, I, I see the Lord, um, I said, I started declaring, I said, there are, there are rats in the ceiling, there are rats in the ceiling, and the Lord says, I will strike the rats with lightning, I will strike them with lightning, and I will strike them with lightning, and, and they will die. Now, it was just the greatest, weirdest thing, and I heard this, and I said this out loud, I just did this thing, and, and that night, I just said that, right said that, that night, uh, we had a lightning storm in Pittsburgh. And the lightning storm in Pittsburgh, which extended across the whole region, broke the Guinness World Record for the most lightning strikes in <laughs> one lightning storm ever. Mm -hmm. Happened that night, the night after I prophesied that. The storm that came in caused there to be flooding in Harrisburg, which where we were was right in between Pittsburgh and Harrisburg, our, our state capital. And the storm caused such flooding that uh, the capital basement flooded. And when it flooded, the reporters came in and recorded a mass exodus of rats that had been forced out of their homes in the basement of the uh, Capitol building because of the flooding. I sit back and we say, well, what does any of that mean? You know what? Honestly, sometimes I don't know. But I know that when we say things and we get into that realm, sometimes God does some really important things. And so as that series of words progressed, and there's a lot of these things, and I, for sake of time, I, I'm going to try to blitz through some of this because I want you to understand this, but I want to make sure we get here. That's what's more important. Well, another time we were at a, a meeting, and I, I, I spoke prophetically, and the Lord said, uh, watch and see where the next uh, water main break is because that's going to be the next place there will be a bursting forth of my spirit. So I gave this word. We were um, north about an hour and a half, an hour to an hour and a half north of Pittsburgh. And uh, the next day, we had the largest water main break in Allegheny County, the county where, where we sit in, the largest water main break ever broke in history. It shut down water the entire southern strip of the entire county some 300,000 people were without water for two days because this water main broke. And then because that water main broke, 14 other water mains ended up breaking and, and literally bursting like geysers all around town to the culmination of we have scheduled our very first meeting with Patricia King. If you don't know who she is, she's a travel prophetic minister. And we had our very first meeting with her scheduled we had 500, 500 and some people in attendance for this meeting. And at the meeting, in the building where we had the meeting the day before the meeting, a water main broke inside the building. And, and so then we came in the building to it having the whole, whole lower level was completely damaged from the water main break. And we were meeting above all that, so we'd have to have the meeting still. But I'm sitting, literally sitting in... Uh, the manifestation of a prophetic word. And I remember standing up front and standing in front of everybody and I said, don't curse this 
water anywhere in all the drama that's downstairs because we're walking in a prophetic word right now. We might not see it all, we might not understand it all, but we are walking in a prophetic word. And if, and if we got that far with our word, then that means the ending of the word is going to be true too. And that's what's really important to remember. One time I was in, uh, I was in uh, the Caribbean, ministering at a church, and um, I had a translator at this church, and I had not really been used to working with translators. But when you work with a translator, it's really kind of hard because you have to talk a lot slower. Yep. And when I prophesy, I don't prophesy very slow sometimes. And so I, I was trying to deal with that while releasing this prophetic word. And at the meeting, um, the senior pastor of the church was my translator. So I start prophesying, and there's about, I have probably about 400, 500 people in this sanctuary for this day. And um, I'm prophesying, and as I'm prophesying, a couple sentences at a time, people are literally dancing in the aisles. And I thought to myself, well, this is a good word, but I didn't think it was that good of a word <laughs> that people would just be totally freaking out. And, and I mean, like, literally dancing. I mean, people were, like, doing the work. I mean, it was so over the top. And uh, I'll give you the word. I, I, I said, uh, I said, the Lord said that there was uh, a new wind going to blow across the island. And the wind was going to blow as a fresh wind of the Holy Spirit. But that man had stepped in to try to gain power and control over the word. And they built wind turbines in order to profit off of the, the power of God manifesting in this region. And the Lord said, I'm coming in as a judge of unjust judges. I'm declaring judgment against those who would use the move of God for their own profit. Is that a word that you would be dancing in the aisles for? I don't know. But people were dancing, freaking out. In the middle of giving the word, the pastor who translates for me goes down under the power of the Holy Spirit, throws her wireless mic across the room, and says, someone keep translating for him. Don't stop prophesying. <laughs> so I finished the prophetic word. There was a little bit more to it than that, but that's the gist of it. And I did my thing, and that was at the end of the service. And uh, at the end of the meeting, the pastor comes up, puts her arm around me, and she says, I just want you all to know that I, to I told Lance nothing of the lawsuit against us and the government. Oh, no. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> but I was told I had to go back to my hotel room and they couldn't meet me for lunch because um, there were members of Congress in the, in, the, in the church that morning and were accusing the pastor of mistranslating my prophetic word oh, to make it sound like um, to, to make it sound like the case that she was one of the senior representatives for for this issue of the wrongful building permits being issued of a wind turbine oh. being built on the island. Hmm. And in the room also happened to be a couple of judges that were apparently paid off oh. in order to have these permits oh. been issued. <laughs> oh snap. That is correct. Oh snap is correct. I was told to stay in my hotel room. <laughs> well, I was in a foreign country. <laughs> uh, we met for dinner and I heard the whole story. And, and a week later, uh, the judges stepped out. They recanted all their statements and shut down the whole building project. See, I'm telling you something is that I want you to understand that when we move prophetically, there is a, sometimes things that we don't always see. And today I may prophesy something that I don't understand at all, and it might make a lot of sense to you. Or I might prophesy something that it make absolutely no sense to you, but it might connect a week later. Mm -hmm. And I want you to understand that, because if we can have faith in the room to believe that God wants to speak something through his prophetic voice, yep. then we can believe that God's going to create a new future from the path that we are on right now. Yeah. And I want you to understand that us knowing the future is important to God. We oftentimes think that we want to know the future for our sake, but that's not true. Mm. We, God gave the gift of prophecy for the building up of the body of Christ, not for the building up of God. 
God does not. He already knows the future. He already knows what he's doing. He already knows how the earth is going to respond. Yet he gives this gift to the church for the growing of our faith, for the building of our principles, so that we manifest the kingdom of God in a further and fuller way. That, that is the, Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians that, 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 that the gifts of the Holy Spirit were given to the church so that we could become and reach the likeness of Christ. Yes. Amen. That is, that's what we're here to do today. So, Amen. Uh, I, I, this might be a new kind of meeting for you. I know you guys are on the verge of breaking out. We're just going to have fun. That's my heart, okay? So we're just going to have fun. Woo. And I'm going to release what the Lord says to release. And I'm going to believe that God's going to do something. And that when he does, um, I want you to have faith to believe it with me. And that and as a church, that we can we can create the future that God has for this future. Of this building, of this church, of this house, of these pastors, of this facility. There's a lot going on here. And uh, just to so you don't just say, well, it's all about lands. Uh, I do want to show you in the word real quick one example of this. And then we're going to go at it, okay? So if you, if you have a Bible, um, we are going to look at this, 2 Kings chapter 3. This is a really cool scripture. And I think when I prayed, the Lord brought me to this for this house. So I want you to understand that. Not only does this word explain what I have already said so that you know that now I'm not a heretic, because I'm going to show it in the Bible, but I, but I believe that this is also a very important concept for this house. So twofold element to the scripture today. In 2 Kings chapter 3, it says, verse 1, Jehoram the son of Ahab became the king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year. Jehoshaphat the king of Judah and reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. But not like his father and mother, for he put away the sacred pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who he made Israel sin, and he did not depart from them. Now, Mesha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he paid the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But it happened that when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time, and he mustered the men of Israel. And he went and sent Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me and fight against Moab? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are. My people are as your people, and my horses are as your horses. But he said, which way shall we go? And he answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. Let's stop there for a second. I want to make sure you guys get the concept that's happening here before we get into the manifestation of how God moves. Mm -hmm. At this point in time in the nation of Israel's history, we have a, a split nation. We've got northern and southern. We've got Israel. We've got Judah. Both carrying the same prophetic lineage that God had called them to be. However, they both were selecting separate kings for a wide variety of reasons. But for this context, let's remember that sometimes they worked together and sometimes they did not. And that's something that's worth remembering, is that Israel and Judah sometimes worked together, sometimes they did not. But in this context is one of those times where they worked together. Now, if you know the history, you'll know that Judah had fought against Moab because they had fought a battle and lost a few chapters previous to this as well. So when Israel says to Judah, um, we're going to go take care of Moab, Judah says, oh, I've been looking for a chance to get back at him anyway. So that's really why they said this is going to be one of those moments that we're going to come together, that we're going to work together, and we're going to see this happen. But since Judah had already lost once before, they knew that they had to leverage their northern brethren in order to make this happen. So really, he's like, I'll fight this battle, 
But it's got to be on your terms because the last time we tried didn't work out all that well. So both the northern and the southern tribes of Israel are going to come and rally together against Moab because Moab was supposed to be paying essentially his taxes. I and mean, that's really what it was, some kind of tax agreement. More than likely because nations would make these kind of agreements where you had stronger communities, which Israel was definitely one of the stronger communities in this region at this day. They would say, in exchange for us being able to stay close to you and be able to lean on your military time whenever we have somebody fighting us, can we cut covenant together and say that I'll pay you some things in exchange for you watching over us? So Moab essentially broke their agreement because they stopped paying their dues to Israel. So Israel's about, we're going to step in and we're going to take care of this. We're going to even out this course. So they're going to go through Edom. Now, Edom is important to know that they go through Edom because Edom is another, another tribe, not a, not a Jewish tribe, but another foreign tribe with foreign gods um, that is also under the, these kind of like protection agreements where they're close in proximity and get to be able to have the benefits of while not, while not maintaining all the costs associated with being a direct citizen. We have this problem in Pittsburgh, and problems like this in lots of major metropolitan areas, where you look at, for example, New Jersey is basically treated as a suburb of New York City. But it's its own state, so they have their own rules, their own regulations, but they have to create some kind of Workarounds to work with New York because basically, if you live in Newark, you are in New Jersey, you are working in New York. That's what it is. But it's totally different governments, totally different setups. That's kind of this is. So it makes sense so far. You guys with me? So they think they're, we're going to go in. We're going to fight this battle. We're going to go in. We're going to go through Edom. We're going to get the King of Edom on our side as well. So it's going to be the battle of three kings versus Moab. And that's where we're at. So, now let's continue. Verse 9. The king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on the roundabout route seven days. And then there was no water for their army or for any of their animals. This is a big deal. This is kind of a huge snag in the process. Now, mind you, remember, Israel... The whole area of Israel, Judah, is essentially all big desert. I mean, it's really all that it is. So water is a big deal. Going through the wilderness of Edom was the best idea because it had a strategic advantage of having areas where there was a lot of rain, a lot of ability to move people through without having to deal with the geographical structures of the community that would hinder them from being able to enter the water easily. So this is really the best way. So they went the best way, but as they are going the best way, every single problem that can come against them has come against them. And essentially at this point, they are so far into this battle, mm -hmm. seven days in, no water, that if they can't get a miracle right now, their whole army is going to die, not at the hands of the Moabites, but at the hands of dehydration. And Israel, Judah, and Edom are all involved. And their whole kings and their whole armies are about to die for the cost of 100,000 lambs. Verse 10. The king of Israel says, Alas, for the Lord has called three kings together to deliver them to the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here that we might inquire the Lord by him? I want you to just, just hear this for a second. The merging of the kings to leverage this victory brought forth the greatest promise of God. You understand this? That if Jehoshaphat had not been invited to be part of this battle, 
there would be no one that said, let's get a prophet, let's get somebody to do something here. This is key. This is key. Now, mind you, that at this point in time in the church history, none of them, none of the nations are really worshiping God all that well. Granted, Israel had started to put away some of the altars of Baal. However, there was still a pretty lengthy list of issues that needed to be addressed. So when Jehoshaphat says, let's call about and get a prophet. Now, let's see what the prophet has to say. So, second half verse 11. One of the servants said to the king of Israel that Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. And he poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now, Jehoshaphat said, the word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to see him. Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother but the king of Israel said, No, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts live, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, or I would not look at you nor see you. Prophets are a finicky bunch. <laughs> and they'll say and do whatever they want to do. And everyone will deal with it. Because the prophetic voice is so important. Elisha, you gotta understand this. Elisha was is the servant of Elijah, one of the basically understood to be one of the most important prophets in the nation of Israel's history. He is in this army. Not because he's a prophet, but because he's a young guy ready for battle. That's who he is. And he's been approached to prophesy. Now look at this. Verse 15. He says, Elisha says, bring me a musician. And when it happened, the musician played, and the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus says the Lord, Make valleys full of ditches, for the Lord says, You shall see no wind, nor will you see the rain, yet the valley will be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your animals may drink. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hands. Now, for sake of time, we'll paraphrase the rest of it. You can look at this on your own. So what they do, they go out, they dig the ditches, they go to bed that night, they wake up the next morning, and some miraculous way, there was some massive rainfall, waterfall coming up, spring, something or other, some crazy weird things happen, and all the holes that they all dug were all filled with water, and everyone's like, yeah, we can drink, and we have an army filled with three nations of people's best warriors, all jumping in the water, drinking the water, all the cattle drinking the water, all the horses. Everybody's, let's drink all the water, get all that we can. And then you have, here's the crazy thing about it, Moab is on the other side of the ditches. And when they look, because of the way the sun rises, the sun reflects off the water, it gives us this red tinge. Mm -hmm. Maybe because of the ground, it might be because of how Edom and the, and the minerals that were there, it might have just been the reflection of a mirage or something or other, but Edom, the, the major player of Edom's warriors, look out and see red water, and they think blood. And they think, oh my goodness, Edom turned on Judah. And they have already fought. Their army is weak. Let's go kill them. 
and they quick and grab together all their people in a hurry, run to fight, thinking a weak army to find instead the, the miraculously hydrated and ready for battle, three nations ready to slam the Moabites, and they obliterate them. And God's people live. And the prophet's word came to pass. Because God had a plan. See, prophecy can manifest all kinds of ways. It can turn our enemies against themselves without them even realizing it. It can turn our enemies toward us and become allies with us instead so that they sustain the loss while we maintain what we're called to do. Prophecy shapes and creates futures and it manifests the promise of God. And, and I, I'm here because I want to release that. And that this house has an important day coming up here real soon. I'm so excited about your guys' launch. We've been praying. Our church has been praying. You guys have been on our prayer list for our church for a few weeks. But now, we've been praying and I'm believing that this launch is going to be very significant. Not only for you, but for this region. Yes. Because God is looking to not just raise up another church. Like, why would God need another church? Right. He's looking to shift regions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if as a church, you've got to be willing to say, okay, we're going to take on a region shifting mandate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if, we're, if you're willing to take a region shifting mandate, yes. then God's going to give you regions. Yes. yes. And that we won't be able to rightly measure the impact by which we have because we look significantly bigger than we are. And you are, you are very uniquely positioned here. Very uniquely positioned here. Because you have the perfect mix of just outside of the city enough that you can reach the city. But outside of the city enough that you won't annoy people that they feel like they have to go into the city. Hmm. And that in and of itself really sets you apart to be able to impact your region in a significantly greater way. Yes. I mean, I can, I can run up right out of the major city, pop right off the, the interstate, and you're like right here. Mm -hmm. But there's corn as your neighbors. I mean, you can't ask for better neighbors because corn doesn't complain about worship music being too loud. Corn doesn't complain about parking lots getting filled with people, getting filled with the Holy Spirit. Corn doesn't complain about drug addicts coming in and being Jesus. Because the corn doesn't know the difference. And that's one of the greatest things about where you guys are positioned. Because you could reach the people who God wants you to reach without having to worry about offending or freaking out a bunch of neighbors. Without having to worry about getting people to drive too far. Yes. And that's a very significant thing. Because you might not ever reach the people who live across the street. You may never reach those, or we can pray them in, but you may never reach those people. But because of where you're positioned, if you see yourself as a region yes. reaching group, yes. you'll be able to reach and empower the communities yes. down there down there. Yes. Yeah. That God is shifting, and God is not interested, I should say it this way, God is not interested in just planting another church, but he's looking at building a hub. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what I see when I see here, as I see a hub. A hub is a connecting unit, something central that connects others. Yes. And that bridges others, that reaches others, Hubs are, hubs are great. Uh, we can, in my, uh, because we are, our airport is set up in Pittsburgh, you have to take a, basically like a tram from when you get your ticket out to the main area where you can start getting on all the gates. And it makes it for a really, a really neat experience whenever you, you're here in Pittsburgh. It's, it's, you should come in, you get on the subway, you get your ticket, then you go on the subway, then you go through, and then you can find your gates. But this, this hub is, is central because it connects. It acts as a bridge. I've been to other airports that do this very similarly, but have multiple hubs. And you have to travel between hubs in order to get to where you need to go. 
But the thing about Hub, the thing about being a Hub is that you're, you're radically and fully connected to everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. Yet you maintain self-sufficiency within your own concept. And see, that's what I see when I see over this house, is that I see that you are main, you have the ability to maintain that which what you need to do to maintain here. However, you will have wider reaching influences throughout. And I want to tell you this because this is, I know this about Matt personally. This is not prophetic thing. I know this that Matt has the great Pastor Matt has great ability to connect with other pastors and ministry leaders. Now, that's it. it's a unique calling. Don't you understand that? Because if you don't understand that it's a unique calling, then you might just say all pastors do that. I'm going to tell you not all pastors do that. Right. But that is that is that is special on the anointing that is upon your upon your senior pastor, which is a great thing. Okay. So what what I'm going to challenge you right now as a church is that right now you got to understand this. In two weeks here, you're going to have an open house. You're going to be filled to the brim, and you're going to have this great thing. So we got this great thing here. But if you only build here, and you don't build out, you can't be a hub. You have to think hub-minded. And that's why I keep hearing the Lord saying over again. You have to think hub-minded. Which means that perhaps some of the expectations that you or other people coming in here in the near future may place upon Pastor Matt and Beth might not be what God has for them to be. Hmm. And that as a house, you have to decide, okay, is this what God has said for us? And let's aim to preserve that. Because there's a great challenge that as you have a church that grows, there's a great challenge that takes place but you have to create systems that protect the vision that God has given you. Mm. And if there aren't systems in place, then things go and they run haywire. Mm -hmm. The Bible says to not grow weary in doing good. I want you to understand why the Bible says that. Because it's very wearisome to do good all the time and not see fruit. But what I see the Lord saying is both. You'll be able to do good and have fruit on all sides. On all sides. And you've got to be willing to receive that. You've got to be willing to hold on to that. And you've got to be willing to truly believe that this is our word. This is our church. There's some great things coming, guys. There's a lot of great things coming. Yes, Lord. A lot of great things coming. Thank you. Praise the Lord. I hope this morning has been a blessing to you. Um, you receive this. And it's the last thing is important that we do, okay? We prophetically seal this moment. What that means, like whenever you, I don't know if you've ever done canning or anything like that, but after you get everything in, the, in it and you put the seal on it, that's what preserves it and protects it. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit acts as a seal for us and what God has put in us. But I believe that we must prophetically seal these moments so that the enemy can't rob from us. A lot of words, a lot of destinies have been spoken here today. And I, I know a lot of you have got some really good stuff. But let's just, I want you to stand up with me and let's just, just speak that word and prophetically say this. Lord, right now we join our faith together and we seal every word. We seal every word. That may no word fall short. May no word lack faith. May no word be strangled out 